millionaire socialite, best-selling author, world-famous designer. Gloria Vanderbilt had it all, did it all, and very nearly lost it all. She was born into one of America's richest families and one of the most bizarre. Her childhood was a blur of exotic travel, castles, the century's most famous custody battle, and headlines. Little Gloria was the number one target of her day's version of paparazzi. She suffered through the death of an alcoholic father, the neglect of a glamorous mother, and then she tried to compensate with numerous marriages and love affairs. And as biography reveals, when Gloria Vanderbilt finally had what she wanted most, a loving husband and family, again she was struck by multiple tragedies. If you're of my era and you heard the name Gloria Vanderbilt, I mean, you go like this because you've heard her story. Her story was a, a famous American story. Little Gloria was initially presented as this waif, uh, almost an orphan type figure, being uh, torn apart by the conflict between her mother and her enormous family. She was complex. She was witty, she was funny, she loved to laugh and have a good time. She was always sort of catnip to men. Everybody probably thought, you know, she was a little bit off the wall. She'd married all these extraordinary people and she had an art show in an art gallery in one minute. And um, suddenly she made a go of this design stuff. By gum, she made so much money. She made millions and millions and millions. She was indeed the, a pioneer in, in designer jeans. Putting her name on the jeans was indeed the first. Well, I really think the whole creative drive comes of wanting to make order out of chaos. I wanted really to make something of my life. You know, my mom is shaped, I think, by loss and shaped by those she has met and those she has been with and those she has lost. Gloria Vanderbilt. Born into one of the most prominent families in America, Gloria Vanderbilt has emerged as an individual in her own right. Her name has become the symbol for a style that is both fashionably chic and classically elegant. Yet her Vanderbilt heritage has been both a blessing and a curse. She has endured lifelong public scrutiny, faced loss, alienation, family intrigue, and shocking deaths. And through it all, lived with a name that dates back to the early days of American royalty. In the early 1800s, Cornelius Vanderbilt, a boatman, started a ferry service in New York Harbor. This thriving business expanded into a fleet of steamships that plied the world and made him millions. Known as the Commodore, Vanderbilt went on to build a railroad network and become one of America's first millionaires. The Vanderbilts were American royalty. When Commodore Vanderbilt died, the American Stock Exchange closed for three days. When his son, William Henry, died, he was the richest man in America. The Commodore's great-grandson, Reggie Vanderbilt, was considered a prize catch in the 1920s, even though he was a known drinker who had gone through nearly all of his fortune. In 1922, he met the lovely young Gloria Morgan, who with her twin sister was one of the great beauties of the day. When 44-year-old Reggie married 19-year-old Gloria in 1923, it seemed a wonderful match. Alice Vanderbilt, Reggie's mother, was actually very happy that he had chosen Gloria Morgan and what was finally looking uh, at settling down. His sister Gertrude, however, was not so sure that Gloria would be the best for him and maintained some distance. 
Reggie's sister, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, was a married socialite and noted arts patron. She may have had her doubts about the newest Vanderbilt bride, but she and the entire family welcomed the birth of Gloria and Reggie's child on February 20th, 1924. A daughter they named Gloria Laura Vanderbilt. Soon after her birth, little Gloria's parents departed for Europe. They left her in the care of her grandmother, Morgan, and her nurse, whom she called Dodo. It was a situation that soon became a habit. They were really my substitute mothers, because they were really the only mother images, really, f people that I had that were close to me that were there, and we were happy together. In 1925, little Gloria's father died of liver disease. At his death, the infant became an heiress with a $3 million trust fund. Her 21-year-old mother, suddenly single again, headed for Paris and took her baby with her. It was the height of the Roaring Twenties, and the beautiful widow, Gloria, indulged herself in a dazzling world of travel and glamorous partying. Society takes the stage at Dark Ball. Mrs. Gloria Vanderbilt, as sun goddess, is among the 2,000 present at the most glittering pageant in Gotham's social merry-go-round. Little Gloria, quiet and reserved, was cared for only by her grandmother and Dodo and soon felt isolated from the mother she rarely saw. And it was always from the back that I saw her disappearing down the corridor or getting into a Rolls Royce or a Hispano Suiza <laughs> as if she was a butterfly and I was trying to catch her. <laughs> but I didn't. She was very elusive, unattainable, magical. Extraordinary. Little Gloria, a shy and sensitive girl, developed a tight bond with Dodo. Since she was afraid of the dark, Dodo would sleep in the child's bedroom every night. The two played games together, swam, had picnics, and sang songs. It was a relationship typical of wealthy families of the day. Our parents were very removed from us, and so in their place were these wonderful surrogate <clears throat> nurses or nannies or uh, governesses. And Dodo was Gloria's nurse, but more than a nurse. She was like a, a friend and a companion and a mother figure. As they moved throughout Europe, Dodo and Grandmother Morgan began to complain about the elder Gloria's active partying. Gloria enjoyed the attentions of many handsome escorts, among them a young German prince. When she decided to marry him, Grandmother Morgan was outraged. She began a campaign to separate little Gloria from her mother. Wanting to please her grandmother and keep Dodo at her side, little Gloria followed their instructions. She wrote awful letters about her mother and even faked illnesses to prove she was being neglected. Back in the States, the Vanderbilt relatives worried about little Gloria's upbringing. It wasn't typical to go off and party and, and leave the child behind the way Gloria Morgan was. So I think that Gertrude and other members of the family were really behaving appropriately from their point of view when they became concerned uh, about the baby's welfare. When little Gloria returned to the United States, her aunt suggested she stay at her home on Long Island. The sprawling estate became a haven for little Gloria, a secure castle for her and Dodo. Her mother allowed little Gloria to stay on. For the first time in her life, she attended school. Little Gloria was enrolled at the prestigious Green Vale School in Roslyn, Long Island. We were just little girls at school, rather the way she was, retiring, shy, and um, careful to stay with people that she liked or that she trusted. 
little Gloria was now so busy with her country life, she hardly had time to miss her mother at all, and she'd become completely attached to Dodo. One day, while visiting her mother, little Gloria overheard her plans to fire Dodo. The mere suggestion sent her into a crying fit. Dodo took the hysterical child back to Gertrude, who by now was convinced her niece should remain in her care. The stage was set for a battle over little Gloria. Both her mother and her aunt went to court in the height of the Depression. On October 1, 1934, the custody trial called the Matter of Vanderbilt became the talk of the nation. I was little Gloria. I wouldn't want to go with my mother because she went out at night. And in case there was a fire, I would have gotten burnt and that would have been the end of me. Already in a frenzy over the Lindbergh baby kidnapping and its big trial, the press were primed for another major courtroom event. When this trial hit the headlines, the public was hungry and just ate up all the news every day. Uh, they crowded to the trial spot and yelled and screamed at Gertrude and young Gloria. They would yell at Gertrude, don't take her away from her ma, don't do that. Little Gloria herself was questioned by the judge and had bad things to say about her mother. I'd been coached, of course, to say things against my mother. And I was told that if I did, Dodo would stay. And that really is what I wanted more than anything. In the beginning, the sympathy was all, or pretty much, with Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt and the trial was wide open. And then there was a fatal, scandalous moment. That moment came to light when Gloria Morgan's French maid was questioned by her lawyer. He said, did you ever see anything that was the least bit peculiar? And the maid said, well, actually, yes. I came in one morning with the breakfast tray and Gloria Vanderbilt and the Marchioness of Milford Haven were in bed together. And both of these women were kissing each other as if they were lovers. And at that moment, there was pandemonium in the courtroom. And Justice Carew knocked down his hammer and said, this court is closed. In November of 1934, little Gloria was declared a ward of the state. Her Aunt Gertrude was named her guardian. Her mother was declared unfit. Little Gloria would see her only on summer visits. But the real shock for little Gloria was the court's decision about Dodo. The judge felt Dodo was an obstacle to the mother-daughter relationship and ordered her out of the child's life. Little Gloria's one true mother was dismissed on Christmas Eve, 1934. When Dodo was sent away, that was really the most terrible thing that had ever happened to me. Because I was told I'd never see her again. It was a loss from which she would never fully recover. Ten-year-old Gloria was now alone. Back at her aunt's estate, she would live as a true Vanderbilt child with all its gilded trappings, but she was stripped of the love and security that she would now search an entire lifetime to replace. By 1935, 11-year-old Gloria Vanderbilt's childhood was over. She had been dragged through one of the most dramatic and notorious custody fights in legal history, and she emerged the ultimate loser. Separated from her beloved nurse and fearful of her mother, she lived with her Aunt Gertrude, who was herself an aloof and frequently absent guardian. Gloria was left without the love and support she, and most children her age, craved. This was not an era where one was close. We, we were brought in in the morning to say good morning, or we were brought in for tea, or dressed up and uh, that was it. We didn't know it. I mean, we were materially very well provided for, but we were 
emotionally starved and de deprived. The court allowed Gloria to spend summers with her mother, time they took to repair their torn relationship. In July of 1935, the two put on a play, shown here in this home movie. Her mother portrays a queen, and Gloria is her faithful attendant. She combs her mother's long hair and waits on her. When the queen's jewels are stolen, Gloria is horrified. But they are recovered, and in the end, love seems to conquer all. For Gloria and her mother, however, things were never so simple. The more time Gloria spent with her mother, the more she began to doubt if the two would ever become close. I think there are some women that really should not have children, and I think probably my mother was one of them, because she was not... To have a child, you have to extend yourself, and you have to want to extend yourself. Despite her problems, Gloria flourished at the Greenvale School. Though she was an average student and rather shy, an artistic side began to emerge. She played Ruth in the, in the Pirates of Penzance, and she had a marvelous singing voice, a contralto. She was wonderful. And she also was extremely good at painting and drawing. She also had a fascination with the movies. She loved to escape her own troubles by watching the imaginary lives of the stars unfold on screen. Well, I was completely movie struck. All I wanted to do was go to the movies. I felt that the movies were how it was going to be when you grew up and I couldn't wait to get there. <laughs> so in 1937, when her mother took her on a summer trip to Hollywood, Gloria was thrilled. They mingled with many of her mother's star friends like Maureen O'Sullivan and Joan Crawford. They even spent time at San Simeon, the extravagant home of her mother's friend, William Randolph Hearst. We used to have lunches and dinners at this long table in the Great Hall, and of course, my mother was on Mr. Hearst's ride, and I was way down at the end of the, of the table, but it was kind of neat, because I could look up and see all the grown-ups who were there, you know. Gloria had the time of her life, but her adventures displeased her aunt. She decided Gloria needed a more stable environment, Upon her graduation from Greenvale in 1938, Gertrude sent Gloria off to boarding school in Farmington, Connecticut. Farmington was very conventional, and I don't think she liked it at all. You had to wear a Brooks Brothers polo coat, basically a boy's polo coat with white buttons, and Gloria certainly did not, did not wear those things. She wore Angora sweaters or cashmere, I suppose. She was different, and that was not a good thing to be different. Gloria's well-dressed style and artistic sensibilities made her a dynamic combination in her teen years. She became a trend-setting East Coast society girl. She was even featured in the fashionable women's magazine Harper's Bazaar in 1939. Glamour girl, as soon as she could be one. You know, plump little girls aren't very glamorous, but then when, when you get through that stage, she was very much, you know, she went to all those kind of New York parties and had a lot of boyfriends. Meanwhile, on the other coast, Gloria's mother had become a fixture on the Hollywood social scene, and Gloria longed to once again return to that exciting lifestyle. When she turned 16, with permission from the court, Gloria packed her bags and headed out west. It was really as if I was a bird let out of a cage. It was the most incredible sense of freedom. And of course, all I was interested in was dating movie stars. And they had to be much older than I was. Perhaps searching for a father figure, Gloria began dating several older and sometimes infamous men 
like Errol Flynn and Howard Hughes. But it was an employee of Hughes that seemed to take the most interest, Pat DeSico, who was almost twice her age. The former actor's agent was an ardent suitor and soon proposed marriage, and to many people's surprise, Gloria accepted. I don't think I could have chosen anything more perfect to get my aunt's attention, to really annoy her, which of course it did. He was perfect for that. Wanting to escape her aunt's control and her tense relationship with her mother, 17-year-old Gloria married 31-year-old Pat on December 28, 1941. We thought when we were married, this would be a marvelous different world. But you know, we didn't know anything then at 17 or 18. We, we, we didn't know anything about life or people. We didn't have a clue about anything. Well, I think there's no question that she was on an enormous search for her own identity. I think she was always looking to find out who she was. Yet Gloria's new burst of independence was tinged with sadness. Her Aunt Gertrude died four months after the ceremony. She remained against the marriage till the end, though her niece ignored her negative feelings. With the nation now entering World War II, Pat enlisted. He and Gloria lived on army bases until they moved to New York City. Between assignments, Pat, a second lieutenant, indulged in the big city nightlife. He started to drink and gamble, which fueled his well-known quick temper. A violent side emerged in him that was soon directed at Gloria. I think very often that uh women who are in an abusive situation, which I was, he used to beat me up. You're ashamed. Gloria turned to painting for comfort. She also met a man who dazzled her at first sight, the distinguished and talented conductor Leopold Stokowski. As her 21st birthday neared, Gloria knew she would soon have control over her large Vanderbilt inheritance and could do what she wanted. She decided she would effect major changes in her life. She left Pat in January of 1945, and she began making plans for her future, a future she hoped would bring her the security and love that had so far eluded her. In 1945, 21-year-old Gloria Vanderbilt took charge of her life. She now controlled her $4 million inheritance. She paid $200,000 to Pat DeSico. They divorced in April. The day the decree was final, April 21, 1945, she married the new man in her life, famed conductor Leopold Stokowski. I absolutely loved him. A lot, yes. First of all, he was a genius whose music to me was glorious and wonderful. And it was, it was an extraordinary thing that happened to me. The two were a charming and sophisticated couple who seemed to delight in their life together, even though there was an almost 40-year gap in their ages. Gloria and Leopold had a wonderfully whimsical, playful, uh, slant on life. I remember once they pitched up at my apartment at on West 57th Street and they were he was in full black tie and she was in a beautiful lame evening dress and I came to the door in an old wrapper and they said we're here for dinner and I said oh oh but it, 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 it's next week and of course they knew perfectly well and they were just playing a joke Gloria and Leopold settled down on a farm in Connecticut. 1950 saw the arrival of a son, Stanley. A year later came another boy, Christopher. Gloria enlisted a housekeeper to help with the boys. Now she could continue her work as a painter and juggle the duties of motherhood as well. 
Sometimes she managed to combine both her children and her art. Various times the walls would be, get plastered and then while it was still wet we would take all these different seashells and, and cover the wall. We covered the whole wall with that. Gloria also tried her hand at acting. In 1954, she made her stage debut at the Pocono Playhouse in The Swan. Gloria portrayed the princess. The New York Times praised her performance, noting she seemed more at home on stage than other veteran actors. Gloria was now hooked on acting. She immediately secured an agent, and she took on other roles. She had found a new creative niche. Gloria Vanderbilt was the ingenue. I mean, she was wonderful looking and uh, just wanted so much to be an actress at that, at that point in her life. I mean, I, I'm not trying to say this, she was going to be Greta Garbo. No, I, I don't mean that. I, I mean that uh, at that time in her life, she wanted to be an actress and she was acting and she was good. Though Leopold encouraged her painting, he was not thrilled with Gloria's interest in acting. He seemed to consider it a lesser art form. Problems began to surface in their marriage. Gloria had been supporting her mother with an allowance from her inheritance. Leopold urged her to cut off that allowance, which caused a media stir and further eroded the fragile mother-daughter bond. His heavy touring schedule also took its toll on their family life. In 1954, after nine years of marriage, the two separated. I would go with my father uh, on weekends and most of the summers, and then be with my mother during the week and on part of vacations. And, um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of difficulty to that. It would have been great if they had communicated more uh, but, uh, you know, for various reasons, they didn't. Now 30 years old, Gloria began to exhibit a growing sense of independence. While she still searched to find a secure and satisfying life, she explored her newfound freedom. Soon she was seen around town on the arm of one of the country's biggest stars, Frank Sinatra. She divorced Dukowski in 1955 and continued to act appearing in the play Picnic. Her director was Sidney Lament. Before long, a romance blossomed between the two, and they married August 27, 1956. She married Sidney Lament, who was this quintessential New York tough guy, movie director. I think she was attracted to this kind of gritty uh, Jewish guy from the streets grew up in Queens or the Bronx or someplace, you know, she, she wanted experience. Unlike Leopold, Sidney encouraged Gloria's career. She expanded her roles from the stage to television. You know, Johnny Long here, I've been thinking. What about? I want you to go to medical school. We've been all over that. Please, Johnny. Please think about it. Promise me. All right. I'll think about it. Johnny, I mean it. You've always wanted to, and now Dr. Coleman says you should. Do you have any idea? Well, I know the money, but I can get a job. With a baby? Way. I may not have a baby. In 1959, Gloria found herself right back in the thick of another court battle reminiscent of her own childhood trauma. This time, it was over her sons. Leopold Stokowski filed suit to gain full custody of the boys. The battle was draining, but Gloria prevailed. Still, her troubles continued. Cracks began to appear in Gloria's marriage to Sidney, caused, she felt, by her increasing career ambitions. The timing was wrong because Sidney always puts the life first and the work second. But I was not that way then. I put the work first and the life second. 
so the timing was wrong. But just because the marriage ended doesn't mean it wasn't happy. I think Gloria's a terrific romantic, and I think romantics tend not to stay married all that long to the same person, necessarily. After seven years together, Gloria and Sidney divorced in August of 1963. Shortly afterwards, she found love again with the Mississippi-born writer and editor Wyatt Cooper. Warm, sensitive, and full of Southern courtliness, Wyatt became the steady partner Gloria needed. He could give her the love and support she had longed for since childhood. They married on Christmas Eve, 1963. Soon, Gloria found herself living in the happiest and most fulfilling period of her life, a time that would soon make the well-known heiress into a household name. By the mid-1960s, it seemed Gloria Vanderbilt had finally found the happiness she longed for. Now in a solid marriage to Wyatt Cooper, she was able to enjoy a wonderful home life at last. It was the calmest of the marriages, I think, in a way, and very sturdy. Wyatt was just right for her. You know, some people are just right together, and they were. Gloria also developed a closer relationship with her mother. After years of estrangement, the two finally started to get along. But a lifetime spent living in alienation still left Gloria slightly uneasy about their bond. She was the most passive, gentle person you could possibly imagine. And when Wyatt met her, he said, this woman doesn't know one single thing that's ever happened to her. And I really think that's true. I also don't really know how bright she was, really. Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt died in February of 1965. Her daughter was filled with sadness. The two had become close, but still never established the bond that Gloria had longed for. In Gloria's last conversation with her mother, she told her about the birth of her grandson, Carter. With the arrival of Anderson in 1967, Gloria's family was complete. And since Wyatt was a devoted dad, she could observe firsthand the role of a loving father. Wyatt Cooper was an extraordinary father. I had never really understood what a father could be like, but I did when I saw how Wyatt was with Carter and Anderson. It was a sort of miraculous revelation to me, and it was sort of really like I had a father, too. And Gloria reveled in motherhood, but she was hardly the typical parent. Her style was definitely looser and more laid back than that of more traditional women. I mean, I always have sort of viewed her as this sort of incredible apparition, almost. You know, I don't think we ever expected um, her to be baking cookies and on the PTA. I mean, there was always this great sense of, um, you know, my mom is sort of this unique creature, and so is my dad, and, and so um, I sort of the values that were instilled in me were, you know, that it's important to be unique, and it's important to, uh, to be yourself as opposed to sort of going along with what the crowd thinks or what other people say. Fulfilled in her family life, Gloria concentrated on her professional one. Her paintings and collages spawned an interest in design. In 1968, Hallmark asked her to create cards and stationery. She also got a call from a textile firm to design fabrics. When a Hong Kong-based company asked her to lend her name and creative input to their clothing line, she agreed. By the early 1970s, Gloria had established a solid reputation in the fashion world. I think it was something that interested her and charmed her because she was so well-dressed herself. She had been dressed by all of the great dressmakers in Paris and in New York. The woman de tends to design for herself, and that indeed is what Gloria did when she was doing the Gloria Vanderbilt collection. She was also making money, lots of it. By 1976, her company was bringing in millions and was being courted by larger corporations. Gloria was now making her mark as a businesswoman, quite a surprising role for a wealthy heiress. And there's nothing so nice as making money of your own. It was marvelous for Gloria 
to make her own money. And by gum, she made so much money. She made millions and millions and millions with blue jeans and sh sheets and uh, china and household things and goodness, I mean, she had hundreds licensees with her name, Gloria Vanderbilt, there it was. And the place where that name became most prominent was on the denim-clad bottoms of millions of American women. Gloria started a fashion sensation. Well, she was indeed the, a pioneer in, in designer jeans. Doing the jeans, putting her name on the jeans was indeed a first. Look, my jeans and top. Imagine what uh, an impact that must have had among the, the New York elite who saw this prominent name that had been associated with uh, philanthropy splashed on jeans of all things. And she had so much fun doing the advertising. Uh, she just gave a very different attitude from what women of her class are supposed to portray. But while Gloria was coming into her own professionally, she suffered a severe personal blow. Wyatt, who had long suffered from heart problems, had a major heart attack in 1978. Waiting in the darkened hospital, Gloria was not prepared for the agonizing announcement she soon received, that Wyatt had died after an unsuccessful operation. For Gloria, it was another painful loss of a loved one. He was only 50 when he died, and it was, it was just inconceivable to me that he would die. I, I really couldn't believe it. In Gloria's darkest moments, she refused to break down. Though she began seeing a therapist, she remained strong and determined, something she had learned from her long-ago struggles. Gloria said that no matter what happened, she had really emotionally died years ago when she was 10. She just learned to be very stoical and self-contained. Now a single mother, Gloria focused on her family and her work. By 1980, Gloria Vanderbilt Jeans grossed over $160 million. She launched a signature perfume in 1982. Vanderbilt, a rich, expressive fragrance that reveals to the world just how splendid you are. Vanderbilt, let it release the splendor of you, Vanderbilt. And she wrote two volumes of her memoirs in which she finally explored the details of her turbulent childhood. With a successful career, created apart from her famous family and a new understanding of her past, Gloria seemed secure. But soon another personal devastation would disrupt her life, an anguish unlike anything she'd ever known. By July of 1988, Gloria Vanderbilt had suffered many blows, but had emerged unbeaten. Yet nothing she had experienced could prepare her for the tragedy that soon overtook her life. Once again, it was a loss she could not prevent, and from which some thought she might never recover. On a warm Friday evening when Gloria was in her room, her 23-year-old son Carter entered. He'd gotten up from a nap, dazed and confused. He ran through his mother's apartment and headed out onto the terrace, going right to its edge. And sat on the uh, edge of the balcony, and he put his hand up like that not to come near, and uh, I started to get down on my knees, and I said, Carter, he said, don't do that, Mom, don't do that. And he put his hands on the edge and hung down, and I just let go. Carter slipped over the side and fell 14 stories to his death. He 
she was stunned. That's the only word I can think of, just absolutely stunned. She um, talked about it, described what had happened. It's just one of those moments in life, you know, when you just think, what? What? You know, it can't have happened. People speculated on whether or not Carter's death was a suicide. Gloria came to believe he had been sleepwalking, and that, combined with a new medication he'd been taking for respiratory problems, caused his untimely accidental death. Yet despite her overwhelming grief, she was determined to go forward. When Carter died, one of the things that that really sustained me moment by moment. I thought, I, I want to be on my feet. I want to show that a person can experience this and survive and live on and have a life. The amazing thing about her is that um, despite surviving uh, things which are for many people unimaginable, um, she has maintained this vulnerability and this ability to sort of be touched and moved by things. That is her greatest strength. By the early 1990s, Gloria found the will to continue on with her life, despite the devastating losses she had suffered. She began to ease herself out of her business projects to concentrate on her art, but soon faced another crisis. Two people whom she trusted completely betrayed her her longtime therapist and the lawyer he'd recommended to handle her finances cheated her. The two of them together formed a company and defrauded me of my business, money that I'd worked for. In 1993, a court ruled in Gloria's favor, and she was awarded some of the money she'd lost. But she was never able to collect it. Reports of financial trouble soon plagued Gloria, tax debts and legal bills began to mount. The one-time millionaires was forced to sell her homes and live more modestly. Still, Gloria did not allow financial setbacks to defeat her. In 1996, she rebounded with a well-received account about her son's death and her own acceptance of the years of loss with which she'd had to contend. Throughout her life, she'd struggled to find the stability and love she lacked as a child. But it was in that singular struggle she discovered her own unique strength. Well, you see, I think we're all survivors. Everyone in the world is a survivor. Because it's my belief that pain and joy, fear and hope, Desperation and determination are always joined. I look around and I see plenty of people with famous last names who, you know, have done diddly squat. I don't have much respect for them, you know, and uh, I've got a lot of respect for my mom. She's managed to handle herself, and I think in an extraordinary way. She somewhat has some of the naive qualities of a child, and at the same time, she's one of the most sophisticated women I know. I think that other people would have cracked easily under the pressure that she's been subjected to in her life. She's a star, Gloria. It's what she is. This is no 15 minutes. This is real, lifelong problems of a kind that you either learn to handle or you go under or you lose it. Her life is inextricably tied to this moment in America when, you know, all of these people who had made their fortunes had become big social names. She has to drag that behind her for all of her life. I think there's more to come from Gloria Vanderbilt. This is a woman who's never gonna just sit back and settle into her seventh decade. It's just never gonna happen. Gloria Vanderbilt's book published last year is called A Mother's Story, but originally she considered another title, The Glass Bubble, a reference to the wall she erected around herself as a child. She says that that emotional wall existed until 
Carter's suicide, after which she sought out the help of others and even joined a support group filled with strangers. The first sentence in her autobiography speaks volumes. Some of us, she writes, are born with a sense of loss. Gloria Vanderbilt has had more than her share.